Cool. So I just want to uh, remind us this morning and shine the spotlight on the transformational power of the gospel. This, this gospel or this, this message um, that we have, the gospel of the kingdom or good news as, we've, as it's called, has transforming power. And as I preach, some of this won't be new. I also want to testify it is the one single thing that's produced the most radical change in my life, but also the most change in terms of amount. You know, the, the most consistent thing that's changed my life is believing this good news about Jesus Christ. And it's still changing me. And so in one way I'm kind of preaching, in another way I'm standing and I'm testifying and I'm saying in my own life this is what brings change. And so just want to say straight up to you today, if you, are, if you are needing a change, the gospel is the answer. Uh, it has the power to transform. And even the way that we walked into this doesn't have to be the way we walk out of this. So let's go to the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. It's the furthest I've seen Arnold seen uh, sit for a long time, Arnold there. Eh? Nice to see you in the back, man. Under the watchful eye of Jackie and Jacob. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4. Paul is writing to a group of people that he had met a couple of, like quite some time ago. And he had about three weeks with them. And he shared a message with them. And something happened to them. And now he's writing back to them, the same group of people. And in verse 4 it says, It is clear to us, friends, that God not only loves you very much, but also has put his hand on you for something special. When the message, and you see it's a capital M, when the message we preached came to you, it wasn't just words, Some uh, like the NIV says, um, it came not only with words, but also with power. It says, when our message came, something happened in you, uh, which means it wasn't just an experience they went through because then he would say something happened to you. He says something happened in you. Uh, the Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions and you paid careful attention to the way we lived among you. Isn't that amazing? That this message came to them and Paul is very well aware that it is our obligation and our duty to preach this message of the gospel to everybody. But as he preached it to everybody, some believed it. And as they believed it, it's now very obvious and very clear to him that something is, is different about them. One, God loves them very much. Now, I know God loves the whole world, but somehow the love of God has become very real to these people. And secondly, it's very clear to him that God's hand is on their life for some specific purpose. And so he says when this message came, and you can go back to Acts chapter 17 and verse 3 when you have time and see what was the message that Paul preached. He, he was using the scriptures, and it says that he was explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And then he said, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. That was what he preached. And he preached it, and then they believed it, and then there was these changes in them. First of all, there was something happened inside of them. It wasn't just a, a um, you know, something that took place in their life, and it happened, and it was an event. Something inside of them has changed. It wasn't just words. It wasn't just outward. It wasn't just superficial. But it was permanent. And you could tell they were changed. Simply believing that message. Secondly, he says that it's obvious now because the Holy Spirit had put some steel in your convictions. So maybe, I don't know, maybe they were kind of wishy-washy, this way, that way, not really anything firm. And somehow the working of the Holy Spirit as they believed this message brought some strength to what they believed about God. It's amazing. It was just the message he preached. They believed it, and something happened to them. Um, 
And then also what I love there is he said, you began to pay careful attention to how we lived among you. There we see discipleship again happening. Isn't that amazing? One message, a whole lot of people, but to those who believe, it brought change. And so um, we know in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But for us who are being saved, we know it's the very power of of God. Now I know this sounds strange, but how can a message bring such radical transformation in someone's life that they are changed, suddenly the Holy Spirit's working, and suddenly their convictions are like steel about God? This is the miracle of believing in this message. Now some people it's just foolishness, but for those who believe it's the very power of God, and that's how God is changing lives. I know people are often looking for change. If you um, watch any TV, there's always programs about change, isn't it? Have a makeover, no, new teeth, new hair, new face, new uh, house, new car. It's always, but the problem is it's always outward. And even in this season, I mean, like we're, people are looking to politicians to make a change to their circumstance or their situation. Um, some people are looking for some magical product or, you know, some secret that's somehow going to bring this change in their lives. But I want to say today what the gospel offers is transformation, such change inside of you that it changes every part of your life. It's the one thing that the world can't do because it's authentic change, it's permanent change, it's God change. Uh, another verse that we, as we, as we jump into the Second Corinthians chapter three, verse eighteen, it says, "And we all, with unveiled faces, behold the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit." And so, it's very clear here: when our eyes are opened, and we believe that message, and we see God through what He has done in Jesus. It's not a self change, but it's a change that comes from God. I'm amazed how I, I think probably in my own life uh, still there is change happening, but a radical change. So much so when, I, when, when my eyes were open and I believed this message that people actually said, like, what's wrong with you? What happened to you? Um, so is the transformation that comes from the Lord, that it's permanent and it's long-lasting. And can I also say that I think sometimes we make a mistake that as the church we think it's a once-off. By believing that message, there's a change, and then after that it's up to you. But I want to say still change comes today in my life by believing the truth about Jesus. Still. And you can see in that scripture, it's from one degree of glory to another, which means it's an ongoing change, still by believing in what Jesus has done. And this is not just for sinners, and it's not just for people who we think need a change, it's for me. The only way I'm transformed is by believing in the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And so it's an ongoing change. Um... I know we live in an age where news is super important and it's become a big part of our lives, isn't it? Uh, it influences our modern day so much because we're in this information age. There's constantly news coming. And where, if you believe in that news and you act on that news, it's got certain consequences, right? So, I mean, in 2016, there was a young man, 21 years old, he walked into a church in South Carolina and he pulled the trigger 77 times. I think he killed 22 people in that meeting. Didn't know one of them. Never met one of them. When they arrested him and put him on trial, they realized that he had been reading news about those people that weren't true. And he believed it and he acted upon it. So news is absolutely crucial 
that the details are correct and that the news is coming from a reliable source and that you act and believe that the, the, the news that's true. I mean, the opposite is also true, isn't it? If, if there's news that's absolutely relevant and important and you don't act on it, it could also have consequences in your life. And so, um, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. And so, we, we have to understand the news has to be accurate. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. And this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Isn't that amazing? First of all, it's good news. It's not a good story. It's not a good wish. It's not a good will. It's not a good idea. It's good news. The, the, the scriptures clearly chooses that word news because it's a report. It's an account of what has happened as a fact. And so, you know, the difference between Christianity and every other religion is that it's rooted in historic fact. It's not just a change of uh, the message is not just that make a small adjustment, make a small change, here's some values that are good, etc., etc. It's based in a report about what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, if you read uh, um, Luke chapter 1, verse 1, for example, listen to this, listen here. Many have undertaken to draw up an account. So Luke gives us an account of the, the birth of, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled among us, just as it, they were handed down to us by those who from... What? The first. Were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. The words just went weird on my screen. Sorry. Verse 3, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theoloph Theophilus, so that, Theophilus, so that um, you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Isn't it amazing? Luke, if there was nothing to investigate, he wouldn't be able to investigate it. If there were no eyewitnesses, he wouldn't be able to go and get an account from an eyewitness. And so you've got to understand good news means it's a report of what God has done as fact. Recorded in history. It's news. Secondly, it's news about Christ. And the news is about how he came to this earth. And if you think about the context of the earth when he came... It tells us that sin entered the world through one man, and so sin spread to all men, and all men uh, uh, died because of sin. The wages of sin is death. The context was that we'll all have to stand before the righteous judgment seat of God. It's in that context of a fallen, broken world that by fact, as we've read the reports, that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and inserted Him into the history of mankind. I'm just saying, Christianity is not someone's great idea. It's not just a story. It's not just like, you know what, our way of doing things. It's based and rooted in good news, uh, and it's factual. Um, he lived among us. He was tempted in every way, like us. He gave his life as a sacrifice so that the punishment that's supposed to come from God to the whole world was put on Jesus Christ. And he died a, 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 a death of crucifixion. He was buried. He was put in a tomb. And then he rose again. It's fact. Because we have eyewitnesses. We have written accounts of these things. He rose again. He showed himself to many witnesses. And then he ascended into heaven and said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
Romans chapter 3 verse 22 tells us that it's the good news about Jesus. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. No matter who we are, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood so you understand how this works Paul goes and he shares a message based in fact and those who believe it there's a transforming power of God that's released in their life and suddenly something inside of them has changed their convictions turn to steel they begin a discipleship process and more and more they begin to look like Jesus the transforming power of the gospel it's super powerful so it's the good news it's about Jesus Christ and then I want to say you and I have to choose how we will respond to that news because just like that young man who based on the news went and acted his thinking his attitude his actions his life was based on what he believed was true and he acted on it and it had an outcome so you and i have a choice what we do with the good news there are t's and c's to the offer that is made through what god has done in, in jesus name um, for example mark chapter 1 verse 15 the time has come he said the kingdom of god is near repent and believe the good news repentance is a requirement if we're going to believe the good news, if you want to receive what the good news offers, you have to surrender your whole life. That's terms and conditions. We can't offer the world or people terms and conditions that God doesn't offer through the good news. Because news has to be accurate. News has to be reported in an orderly fashion so people can understand it and then make a decision. What are you going to do with that? If you believe it, you will not be condemned. If you reject it, you already stand condemned, as John says. Isn't that amazing? Based on believing or not believing the good news. You see, if we want change in the world, we have to understand that the most transforming thing in the world is the good news about Jesus Christ. It's the one thing that can change people. Now, um, you know, as, we, as we bring this, I think we're at cruising altitude. We're, we're, we'll start our descent soon. But what I found about news is that you have to make sure it comes from a reliable source. And so this good news is not from, I didn't see it on Facebook or WhatsApp. That's not where it started. It's got a reliable source. And if you want to read news, if you, you would have heard about fake news. And when you act on news, it has consequences. That's my point. And so our job is to make sure that we share the good news. That's what Paul did. It is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. There's no other way that we are saved except by believing the good news. Think about that. There is no other way we are transformed into His likeness but by believing. Taking my attitude, my mind, my life, my heart, and saying, I'm going to live as if that news is true. That brings transformation. And so the news must be accurate, but the source, what is the source of this good news? Well, first of all, it's an historic fact. And I've already mentioned this, but how cool is this? Often when God does something in humanity, He would announce it beforehand. Why does He do that? So that when it happens, you know no one could have made that happen uh, if they weren't in charge, if they said it like six to eight hundred years ago. You know, you either say it, and if it doesn't happen, well, but if you're going to say it and then it happens, it, it's proof that you are either in control of what's happening or you knew that it was going to happen. And so the first um, source that we have is Romans chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 says God promised this good news 
long ago through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So you have the whole Old Testament prophesying six to eight hundred years before Jesus came, where he was going to be born, how he was going to be born in a stable, how, where he would live, how he would die on a cross. Details about his life that you would not be able to even know. How many of you know what the culture is going to be like in 600 years' time? And so God says, this good news is an historic fact you can trust because it comes from a trustworthy source. Why? Because God announced it through the prophets long before it even happened. No reason to doubt that. This is not someone's good idea. This is not a, a kind of a small life change. This is historic fact. In fact, every time we write our calendar, A.D., or, 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 or B.C., we're acknowledging that even the world, I know they're now trying to change it to B.C.E., but it acknowledges the fact that something happened. Jesus Christ was inserted into the history of mankind. You cannot deny that fact. Jesus, uh, God prophesied it. And then it says here, the good news is about His Son. In His earthly life, He was born into King David's family line. I mean, even that, you draw the family records and you find Jesus' descent. And it says, He was shown to be the Son of God when He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. We sang about this this morning. There's kind of two proofs in that verse for me. One is the, the promises about Jesus' life and his details through the prophets in the Old Testament, but secondly, this empty tomb. The fact that he was proven to be who he said he was by the empty tomb. They, they still have not found the body of Jesus. And, I, and I've said this here before, but you know what? When they buried Jesus and he rose again and he showed himself to his disciples, his disciples started preaching forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus. Now, if let's take someone we know Alex if if Alex dies you're at his funeral you go to his funeral you go to the grave where he's buried and 40 days later I come to you and I say to you guys you know what he's resurrected from the dead and if you believe in him your sins can be forgiven and suddenly people start believing. If you wanted to disprove that, the only thing you had to do is go and get Alex's body. Isn't it? And say, here's his body, they're lying, and that's the end of that movement. Up till today, haven't found the body of Jesus because he was raised from the dead, the tomb was empty, and he's ascended into heaven. The fact proved that he is the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. So the source for me, first of all, is, is reliable because of the prophets, the empty tombs. Secondly, the first-hand witnesses. You know, in modern-day contemporary historians, if they want to establish if it happened, they'll basically say if this can be, if we have more than one um, source that can verify the same fact, we accept it as historical fact. Look at all the evidence that's here. First of all, uh, two separate guys, and there are plenty, but Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter says, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So here you have someone who was an eyewitness giving you the account. What about John? 1 John 1. Two separate guys, independent guys, different guys. 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at, with, which, and with our hands we've touched, and we proclaim concerning the, the word of life. The life appeared, and we've seen it, and we testify, and we proclaim it to you, the eternal life which was from the Father, which appeared to us. Wow. First hand witness. We saw, we heard, we touched, we lived, we testify. This is true. Je the story about Jesus Christ is true, reliable source. Not I heard it from I heard it from I heard it from I heard it. Eyewitness. First, first um, hand. 
What about the written accounts of the Gospels? I've already said that. Now already the evidence is stacking up. And I'm just saying to you, it's called good news because it's based on the fact of what God had done through Jesus Christ. And the power in it is simply believing or not believing. I'm just saying you really do not believe this. Really. You know, for us who are sharing the gospel with other people, this should give us confidence that, man, we're, not, we're actually not trying to convince people of anything that really has really credible good evidence. And there's more to come. The written accounts. I mean, look at um, Acts. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John both writing separate accounts saying the same thing about the life of Jesus. And, and, and Luke writes this in Acts 10 verse 37. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. The king killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. Wow, we are witnesses. Every miracle, everything that's written, I mean, there's evidence there. Lives changed by this man, Jesus Christ, not an ordinary man, the Son of God, proven he's the Son of God, fulfilling all the prophecies, rising from the dead, healing the sick, raising the dead, opening ears, opening eyes. Written account, first-hand witnesses, empty tomb, promise beforehand. I mean, this is beginning stacking up a bit. I tell you, what about the testimony of millions and millions of people who have believed this news and have had their lives transformed. I'm talking about serial killers, murderers, drug addicts, prostitutes, every gender, every nation, every uh, age group testifying. Millions believing this good news has changed my life. It's changed my life. Now, I'm not, I'm in my own personal life, I've observed it. God haters, rubbishes, naughty gangsters, some of them are sitting here, <laughs> believing the good news. Something has changed in them. Convictions of steel, following a discipleship process, being so changed that it's not an outward thing, but it's a transformation from the inside out. And I, oh, let's not even start talking about not just individuals, but towns and cities. When revivals break out and people believe this good news, our crime goes down. Corruption goes down. Hospitals empty. How? By believing this good news. That's, that's I tell you, the evidence just stacks up. And the source of the news is not some fake. We can go, we can investigate, we can check and we know. As we start our descent. Six areas that this gospel is able to bring change. And, you know, like I said before, actually to change things on the outside is far easier than changing on the inside. What the world doesn't have an answer for is transformation. It's to change the human heart. And that's why, like, with, um, like Craig, you reminded us with elections coming up, etc., etc., we've got we to gotta, we gotta announce this gospel to people because as God changes one heart after one heart after one heart, that's how transformation and change comes. Isaiah 61, I'll read the passage and then we, we land with this. Do you know right? I have a bottle. Thank you, Uncle Six. This is Isaiah 
Isaiah 61. <coughs> Just mourning is significant. It's not a little ceremony we're doing as a church. It's a demonstration of the transformational power of believing a message. And it's a reminder for, for those of us who have walked this road for a long time that still if I take my attitude and my actions and my thoughts and I act upon that news, there's power. There's power. So Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Now you will remember Jesus took the scroll and he read it and he said, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. And, and this, so it's talking about Jesus and it says here, Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. You know what's amazing about the news? We don't get to make up the news. We don't get to change the news. But the fact of what Jesus has done is good news for those who don't have and who can't do it on their, on their own. Isn't that amazing? It's good news because He did it on our behalf. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, <clears throat> release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, excuse me, <clears throat> and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, and to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of this, a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, and you can interpret oaks however you want. They'll be called oaks of righteousness, oaks and oak esses, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Six things I know when the gospel breaks into a person's life that they are changed in. Number one, that their, their heart is changed. Their heart is changed. Now, it says here, you, you've anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, it's funny. It's a, it's a funny description, don't you think? Because I've never seen someone with a broken heart in hospital being wrapped up with bandage or, or bound up because it's like the heart is... But you, you can see the language that the Scriptures is using here is fantastic because it's like when you break a leg or when you when you wound it or you, you take it and you, you wrap it up and you bind it up and you, you put that... Uh, medicine in there to keep the infection out and it, and it brings healing and restoration to it and such is the power of the gospel that it can reach and do that thing with the human heart all the brokenness all the destruction all the damage of sin and anxiety and pain and loss and rejection and everything that this human heart has carried in this life the gospel brings transformation because it's able to stick like get right in there and heal that heart it's the most transforming thing and you know you can change everything on the outside doesn't change the inside but what the gospel does is go straight straight there and and somehow by his stripes we are healed Somehow when I just believe in what God has done through Jesus Christ, the healing power of God comes into my heart and He's able to heal my heart. It's fantastic. It's, the, it's one of the signs of someone who's believed the good news. The second thing is, is um, this, this thing of liberation. It's this thing of liberation or emancipation is a fancy word for it. But, but I want you to notice, notice there in that verse that it says, and I think they are different. Personally, I think they are different because it says here, uh, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness to the prisoners. I think captives and prisoners are two different things because captives are those who you have an oppressor who somehow come and taken you captive. So you just landed on the wrong side of the, the wrong army somehow. But someone's purpose is to take you and make you a slave and use you for their benefit, to oppress you, to bind you up, to tie you up, to, to use you as a trophy to show their power or whatever they want to do. But a captive is someone who's been captured. 
and you are bound and you are restricted and you are not free because you are being captive. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a bad English. But never mind, moving along. You have been captured. Yeah, you knew, you knew that. Wow, I just think of the things in this world that are so much more powerful than us that capture people. Fear. I mean, all sorts of things that just take people can't come free from. Can't come free. Why? Because somehow this has invaded their lives and it's captivated them and it's captured them. And they can't come free. But you know, a prisoner, the difference is a prisoner is probably someone who's gone to court and probably is guilty and probably has faced the judge and been sentenced and now is living out his sentence in a prison cell. Did you break another one? Okay. You're free, bro. You're free. Don't, don't stress. You're going to blame the baby. <laughs> Two different things. A prisoner is probably sitting in that cell full of regrets. Full of shame. Full of guilt. Every minute of every day, the darkness of his shame and his guilt, the darkness of that cell, you know, there's, there's probably no windows. I mean, I'm not talking from experience, but they tell me. Bars. Steel. Restricted. Why? Because of your own action. When the gospel is able to come and just by believing the good news about what Jesus Christ has done, you see there is no one who can hold Jesus captive. Not even death could hold him. And so he speaks to the captive and he speaks to the prisoner and he says, freedom. Freedom. Be released. And nothing can make you a slave again. Why? Because he says, freedom. This is believing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only does it heal your heart, but it brings liberty. It brings liberty. Freedom from sin. Freedom from things that hold us. Freedom from that dark cell of condemnation and, and guilt and shame. You doing all right? Thirdly, so I'm just saying, If you change everything else on the outside, but you don't change that, you haven't changed humanity. And only the gospel offers the power to change that. It's exactly the power that changes it. Thirdly, um, you know, it says here to proclaim the favor of the Lord. The favor of the Lord. Now, I know if you're in a very worldly mindset, you'll take the favor of the Lord as like more created things. You know, God can just create Ferraris, you know. He can. I believe He can. He can just do what He wants. He's God. He can, he can. That stuff is not the favor of God. There are things far more valuable than Ferraris. I'm just saying, the favor of God is the love of God. Oh, it's, it's so wide, so deep, so long, so high. We can't even understand it with our human understanding. It surpasses that. To even grasp it, we need the power of the Spirit to grasp it. Never mind to even know it and understand it. The love of God. And you see, when the gospel comes, I've watched people who have resisted God, hated God, blamed God, angry with God. When the good news comes and their hearts are transformed, they believe the love of God breaks in there and washes over that heart and there is a deep love for God that comes because the favor of God comes 1 John 3 1 says what marvelous love the father has extended to us well he, he poured it out over us he included us in it it's not like when we came along, God had this incredible love. No, God has always had this love. Now through Jesus, we're just, our eyes are open to it. And it, it, it wow, it floors me every time. God's love floors me every time. Just look at it. We are called children of God. Exclamation mark. And that's who we really are. 
But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because they have no idea who he is or what he's up to. So I realize that when I believed the good news, suddenly my eyes were open to the love of God. And my eyes have not been shut yet to the, the love of God because I keep believing that message and the revelation of God keeps on growing. And not only does it help me to understand God, but also other people. Uh, I've seen, honestly, people full of hatred and bitterness and all sorts of stuff when the gospel comes. Reconciliation comes because the love of God has broken in over that heart. I just want to say when you look at our country, our nation, people hate each other for so many different reasons. The reasons are actually just more now than ever. You've got more of an excuse now to hate people than ever. You know what's the answer? The love of God needs to break into our hearts because we will never have compassion. We will never see the value of a human being unless we see it from God's perspective. And it's only the gospel that opens our eyes to that. And that scripture leads to a, a, the next thing that the gospel changes and that is a new identity. And this is very, very, very transformational. When you believe the good news um, and you understand that your primary identity now is a son or a daughter being fathered by the God of ages, it, it completely changes your thinking, your attitude, your life and everything else. We live in a very insecure world and that is why everyone is grabbing for for goods and things and to belong and, and because security, identity and belonging is what's missing and it flows from identity and you know our authority comes from our identity and so when I know someone's born again is when they've identified themselves as a son and a daughter of God and somehow like the disciples came back to Jesus and said even the demons are subject to us in your name they were like surprised at the authority that God has entrusted to his children. But when you're not, you're super insecure. Remember, you will be called Oaks of Righteousness. That's a, a change of identity. You'll be called something different when the good news breaks in. You're doing all right? I'll bestow on you a crown. Identity and authority right there in Isaiah 61 comes from the gospel and the good news. Because of what Jesus has done, any one of us, no matter who you are, can be a son and a daughter of God. Reconciled to God, under the love of God. It's so life-changing. Amen? And it's not just a once-off. You've got to keep going and believing that truth. That's my point. You have to keep going there and keep believing. And it's by faith from first to last. That's, that's when you stop believing that and you start depending on your own stuff that you gain the transformation, you regress. Last two. Change in purpose and effectiveness. What do I mean by that? Isaiah 61 it says, Oaks of righteousness created for the display of his splendor. I realize a life is truly changed by the gospel when their motivation and their goal becomes uh, I want to display his splendor. I want to display his splendor. I've seen selfish, lazy people so self-centered that it wants to make you vomit somehow change and wanting to serve <laughs> and wanting to just serve and help. You know, their purpose and their goal is completely changed to bring glory to God. Humble, character, everything's changed. And you know, there is an effectiveness that comes in our life when we're born again. And I'm saying this especially for you guys today as this is a milestone in your life. There is an, there is an edge that comes into your life and that is your purpose changes but there's an effectiveness in your life. 
You're effective um, because you're equipped. And the Holy Spirit comes on you. are effective in, in, in you have the wisdom of God. It's not struggling. and strug It's the power of God working in your life. And lastly, there's a new provision. Um, and provide for those who grieve in Zion. You see that? And provide, and provide, and provide. And so when you believe the good news, you understand there's a new provision in your life, and it's heaven. It's God. He becomes the source of everything in your life. When you realize that and your eyes are open, what automatically happens, you your hand opens up and you become a generous person. Look at Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus? Uh, just in short, Luke chapter 19, verse 8. Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. Now Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. He was also a crooked man because he was a chief tax collector. Money was super important to him. And you know what? Jesus had just met him once. Walked into his house. He saw Jesus. And instantly something changed. And the first thing he did is he said, I give half. What a response to the gospel. I give half to the poor. He says, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. He suddenly, after years and years of getting and getting and getting, and all he wanted was to get and to get and to get and to get, because, you know, that's what he thought the source was. Suddenly he realizes my source, everything he is provided for through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything, everything, everything. If, if he's given us the most important thing, his son, will he not give us everything? Everything. He will not hold anything back that's good for us. Everything. God gave everything. <laughs> and suddenly Zacchaeus is like, what, what have I been doing? What have I been doing? And he says, boom. Give half to the poor. If I've cheated anyone, I'm going to... Why? Because I have a different source. Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? What, 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 do we, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? What a glorious, glorious gospel. That through Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection, God's has made us right with Him by faith in this good news. Let's stand. Welcome, Michaela. I'm good. Yes, would you like to help me? It would be really great. Thank you so much. I'm just picking on her because that's all I can see. I, I really felt like this morning God wants to set free. God wants to heal hearts. God wants to change goals. God wants to settle identity. I feel like God wants to, you know, I feel like there's some people who just feel like squeezed into a corner. I don't know, like you've got no space, like everything's on your head, everything's on top of you. And I feel like God wants to just liberate, liberate, liberate. And you might be saying like, Lord, how, what must I do? What, what, give me the 10 steps. And God's just saying, just believe in what I've already done in Jesus. So if we can get ourselves just to a position and a posture of of receiving, whatever that means for you. It means like forget about the person next to you just for a minute. Forget about the bills that need to be paid. Forget about what needs to happen tomorrow at school. 
Forget about the rest of what's going to happen. How long will Donovan and Cherie be under the water? Whatever is occupying your mind. <laughs> Whatever distractions. Whatever urgent thing. Just put it aside for a moment. Whatever you're having to deal with, whatever you're having to address, whatever you, just put it aside for a minute and just open your heart. prisoner, there's some things in your life you can't come free from. I tell you, if you believe in Jesus right now, in the name of Jesus, I proclaim freedom for you. I say liberty, be free, be free, be set free, be set free, be set free. Lord, open the prison doors right now, break the chains, break the hooks, break the bondage, break it in Jesus' name you feel this morning insecure you just you're so super insecure insecure about the future insecure about your job insecure about your marriage insecure about your your i don't know your children your you know, what your future your I pray right now in jesus name son daughter of god just come under that identity Come under that identity right now because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what you really are, John says it. A son, a daughter, that's who you really are. If you feel like this morning like you're just you're super empty, you've got nothing, nothing left. You feel like there's no resource. There's no resource. I'm running out of resource. I'm, I want to remind you today. He's opened up heaven to us through Jesus Christ. God is our source. God is our source for everything, for strength, energy, bread to eat, seed to sow. God is our source. So Lord, let just minister to us this morning. You just breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Just settle these things in our minds and our hearts. I, I almost feel like this morning, Lord, you're saying to us, take your attitude, take your mindset, take your thinking, take your heart, take your life, take your actions, and line it up again with this gospel. It's true. It's, it's straight. It's pure. It's solid. Just make the adjustments. And Lord, as this morning there's a demonstration of old lives being buried and new lives coming through, Lord, let that new life continue to flow through us. Let us be changed from one degree of glory to another by, because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. We love you, Lord. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. We're grateful. We're grateful, Lord. We're not just part of, of, of a you know, a phase or a fad or this is based in, in true fact and we can stand solidly on the foundation of knowing Jesus Christ. The work you have done is perfect. It is complete. It is, it is all we need to know you, God, and to be saved and to spend eternity with you. And so we lean into that and we trust into that. And we pray for our country, we pray for our city. Lord, will the gospel, as Paul said, pray that this message would spread. Break into hearts and minds. Lord, we know in our city many are lonely, many are in bondage, many captives. Lord, many confused about their identity. Let this message ring out from this place on a daily basis from our lives every day. Jesus the good news about Jesus and what he's done to make us right with God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to stay and have coffee and stuff here. Don't expect it at my place because it's not going to be there. This is where you get your hot chocolate. This is where you're going to get your coffee.
because of COVID and stuff, I'm trying to just be wise about how we do this. But once you've had your coffee, et cetera, et cetera, we are aiming for 11 o'clock at 8 Highlands Road. If you don't know where 8 Highlands Road is, follow me or follow someone who does know. We're going to be there by 11 o'clock ready to baptize these guys. It's going to be great for you to be there, witness some of that. We're going to pray for these guys, and we're going to trust God uh, just to, to seal that work. So see you by 11 o'clock, 8 Highlands Road. God bless you. The guys online, cheers.